I am Eva O, and this is the Teaking Podcast. I have been a dominatrix since 2011, and I would like to spill the tea on my life. Thank you for listening. AI companies are courting me. Am I going to regret this? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm very serious when I say that, but at the same time, I'm very excited. Now, obviously, the question of AI is a much huger question, but I'm going to talk about this specific aspect of it in particular. And that aspect is becoming an AI companion, an AI dominatrix, not your AI girlfriend. <laughs> I wonder if people will be able to turn me into that, actually. I'm sure that they already kind of do. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? In my current career, as it is already, it's hard to control how people create relationships with you, especially when you have social media and when you have OnlyFans, people, and even when you know them in real life, people are gonna have their own perspective but I guess in terms of being an AI companion and reaching as many people as I might be able to reach, the potential for that goes up and therefore the risk, right? Is it worth it? <laughs> what are the risks? From my perspective, people can become obsessively attached. They can try to stalk you. They can try to find out ways to infiltrate your life. As a sex worker, you already have to protect yourself from those things. So I don't think that intimidates me. Do the numbers intimidate me? No. I've had so many eyes on me for a very long time. And it might be even more. Is that a bad thing? Will it even be looking at me? Or will it be a version of me? So that's quite an interesting thought for me. Yeah. So I kind of feel like I can lend this entity my likeness, my voice, my intonation and concepts of thought. But it's not going to be me. Not to me. <laughs> I don't feel threatened by it somehow. And I think. Some people feel like it would be a replacement. I think it really depends how we're going to be approaching this, right? I do believe that these synthetic relationships are very powerful. Do I think that they will replace real human interaction? Possibly. Is that a danger? We're at a point in time when a lot of things are changing incredibly rapidly around us. And it's hard to say how we will navigate that. But as somebody who is excited by change, sure, cautious, sure, not informed enough <laughs> about this particular topic, I'm quite excited actually to be getting approached. So at the moment, more than one company is approaching me, quite a few. And I haven't signed anything with them just yet. I have lawyers looking at contracts. <laughs> My lawyers are very excited. It's the first time they've seen such a contract. But they all have a different way of approaching it, which is quite interesting also. Am I going to disclose much? I don't want to get in too much trouble. Because even though I haven't signed anything yet, I probably will. <laughs> So I'll tell you things in non-definitive terms, shall we? Some of the companies are asking me for my entire history of OnlyFans chats. I'll go into the dangers of that in a bit. Some of them are asking for an hour per persona that I would like to communicate of video, of audio, of words. 
some of them are asking me to create photos of myself using a green screen background. Some of them are asking for five minutes of my voice and 20 images that they can create endless possibilities from. <laughs> so the fact that there's such a range is quite interesting to me because it means that the technology is really all over the shop. <laughs> and maybe that should be a warning that everything is all over the shop. But I guess maybe that's for my lawyers to figure out. <laughs> yeah. Now, I've been quite interested in what I call automating my work for a while. I have a membership site that has courses on it that I recorded and wrote once and that I don't need to give again and again. For example, I have <laughs> maybe not automated my sessions, but I've definitely moved them into a profitability of a thousand an hour, ten thousand a day, where I don't have to think about doing too much <laughs> in terms of time and as much energy as I used to expend for a good profit. So I've always been interested in seeing how I can take all of this attention that is put towards me and making my life easier. Now, is becoming an AI companion going to do that? Or is it going to do the inverse? Or am I not even going to notice? I guess maybe that's why this is part one. <laughs> because I really, I mean, I have some thoughts around how I feel about it. And I have a lot of intrigue, but I, this is so hard to tell, right? I think it depends so much if, for example, government catches up and says, hey, you know what? You can have these synthetic relationship platforms. You can create these avatars and make money out of them, but you need to put a warning on it, like a cigarette, like label, right? Or they could say, no, absolutely not. It is criminalized. Go, be gone. And then people are just going to do it illegally anyway. And then maybe it'll become even more lucrative. <laughs> but it could go all sorts of ways. Now, all of these AI companies have actually only just started approaching me over the last two months or so. But the first time when I brushed up against this kind of a dilemma was about a year and a, a year ago, a year and a half ago, just post COVID lockdown in Singapore, actually. Yeah, things were much more free um, in terms of going in and out of the country, people coming in and out of the country. And I was invited to this launch <laughs> at one of the old colonial properties in the hills, in the, in the country side of Singapore. If you can call it a countryside, it's only 15 minutes from downtown. But basically, incredibly rich, incredibly lush area where one house and then a lot of land exists. And this company owned by a few Chinese tech billionaires, uh, that was like their spare house that they would do events in. <laughs> um, they held an event, a launch for their products there. They were creating things for the metaverse and things like these huge contraptions that you could stand in, experience things spatially. And uh, in one of the rooms, something where you could basically just uh, put on a few points onto your body, like uh, sort of like leggings and um, a little few straps on your arms, and you'd see yourself on this screen, and you would have taken on an avatar, right? And as soon as I walked into that room, the person who owned that aspect of the business, who was managing that, said, can we make you into one? <laughs> 
And a lot of thoughts went through my mind in a very short amount of time. The first was, that's very interesting. That sounds fun. The second thought, I will never win against a bunch of Chinese tech billionaires if they somehow decide to forego my contract. <laughs> and I lose control over my image. Mm. But that's quite interesting. That made me think a few things. But before I went on to think those things, I, I uh, ended up in their karaoke room until the early hours of the morning singing and having noodles with them. So that ended well <laughs> in my eyes. <laughs> but what it did make me think more about was what is this ownership of image? How much control do I have over that? What already exists in legislation around how we control that? Because as I've learned over time, if I'm not the one taking a photograph of me in certain countries, maybe in most, I don't own that image. It's the person who took it, you know? So where do these things begin? Where do these things end? Do I maybe not actually even have that association so much anyway? I think for whatever reason, I've always had less of an attachment to my appearance, how I look, what photos there are of me around. It doesn't really bother me if these things are moving in the world. Is that right? Is that wrong? Maybe my lawyers will have some thoughts. <laughs> but for me on a personal level, I've just been non-attached in comparison to how I see other people are for a very, very long time, since I was tiny even. I've always been more an observer of my experience than uh, a participant. Or maybe in equal parts, but maybe more an observer than I see other people doing. I think this could have been also uh, <laughs> expanded upon because of my meditation practice. I practice a style called Vipassana, which is uh, very much about observing what is simply there, or at least <laughs> in an ideal space. And uh, yeah, and th that's probably also strength strengthened that skill. And so I go into this AI game with an observational view on the usage of my likeness. I see it as more of me birthing something new as opposed to birthing me yet again. I believe <laughs> that people will be engaging with this synthetic avatar with this synthetic relationship, in this synthetic relationship, in a way that they know it's an AI. And that may become very emotional for them. That may become very personal. But they would have had the knowledge that this is generated, right? And also, how I see this space differently to maybe the chat GPTs, at least what I am aware of so far in the products that have been shown to me or that I have explored, there are a lot of constraints upon how things are expressed. For example, there are modes to how you can engage with this AI companion. So my modes might be in the dungeon. It might be <laughs> life coach. <laughs> it might be mm, friend. Yeah. So you can choose to hear different aspects of a personality, which seem to be more controlled than the wide ranging spaces that more people are using outside of the companion space. So how do I feel 
about all of these people approaching me. I feel excited. I feel, is trepidatious a word? With trepidation. <laughs> but, but maybe also it will make me enough so that I can bolster myself away from the potential ramifications, <laughs> to be frank. You know, because why do I do any of this? Sure. <laughs> These things go hand in hand, I guess, right? My values are being addressed. I think that I get to be in spaces that are honest with others, that are as consenting as can be, that are engaged, that are engaging with our own humanity and that of others. I think that those things are precious to me. Which makes me laugh a little bit now because is that engaging with humanity if it's an AI companion? I think it's less about engaging in the humanity of someone else and engaging with our own humanity when it comes to these AI companions. I feel like I could, in that state as an AI companion, I think I could help to facilitate spaces of emotion, of self reflection of fulfillment that somebody might not feel ready yet for the off in the offline world world is there a danger of them staying there as a result i think that's already happening isn't it i think that maybe this also comes down to how people are educated about digital spaces how people are educated about how they are to interact with these emerging technologies, how maybe they can even be critical about life in general and their interactions. Maybe this is more about me hoping <laughs> that everybody becomes a little bit more aware of how they move through the world before projecting that on the technologies that are coming up around them. Maybe it's more of a question of why are these people wanting to interact in that way with an AI companion? Or why do I enjoy interacting with this AI companion? How could that reflect in my wider life? Maybe I just want people to be more thoughtful in general and this AI companionship thing is just yet another way for me to come back to that same point. but. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an incredible point in time. You know, I have to say that as a sex worker, I always feel a little bit like I'm challenging societal norms and that my existence is already a political statement and that... It's quite powerful for me to say, you know what, I'm a woman and I am assertive and I wish for such and such and I'm going to make it happen. And I appreciate that you are going to pay me for my time as somebody with this personality. I think that is already, unfortunately, a powerful statement because it doesn't happen naturally enough. And I think that. As a sex worker, it's a powerful statement to be able to do it because society doesn't want to give, especially women, rights over their own bodies, the choices that they want to make to do with my own time <laughs> and my own being. They're not used to that enough yet. It's getting better in some spaces, but these things come and go also, right? So, I can't remember exactly which journalist said this, a Filipina, but uh, I remember seeing it at the Nobel Center in Oslo. And it was a quote because they had awarded journalists the Peace Prize that year. And it was a quote in the exhibition and it said something like, if you don't use your rights, you will lose them. Or if you don't, remember to exercise your rights. 
there is always the danger of losing them. And so <laughs> that really struck a chord with me because as we've seen, for example, in America, when the, the rights of women were taken away quite recently when it came to choices over their own bodies in terms of whether they are able to engage in a termination or not. But then when it comes to me and sex work and not shying away from thinking about who I am and then understanding that I can create a space for it in the world. Mm. But all this to say, <laughs> all this to say that this point in time with these companies approaching me and me potentially making this decision to move forward, to use this likeness this avatar that I've created, this brand, this being, these skills, to use it to create something for my profit. <laughs> I mean, why not? <laughs> oh, there's a question for me. And that makes me think about why we work at all. Why am I chasing this financial freedom? Why am I chasing this particular moment in time when I really don't understand fully what the risks are? I mean, I am trying to inform myself. For example, I've been listening to a lot of this podcast um, by the Center of Humane Technology. I highly re recommend them. I've been trying to inform myself. I have lawyers. I have been consulting with people in my community. But then, you know, when you're at the forefront of something, this is how it is, isn't it? You're not going to know what the risks are exactly. Am I ready to do that? I think as somebody who has already had to live in an environment of risk, in an environment where people are limiting me, I think I'm well prepared. Compared to others, maybe. <laughs> prepared enough. <laughs> More prepared? <laughs> to take on this challenge. And in terms of the money question, I think it's, it's always been something curious for me to think about. Money is a goal. I think that if things were structured differently, and maybe AI will help to make that happen. If things were structured differently and we were able to make it so that we were not chasing stability, that we already felt stable, how would that impact us? How would that be changing my decision to take this risk, right? If we all had our needs met, what would we do with our time? <laughs> I think that we could maybe get to that stage. And in some ways, I am more comfortable these days. And so maybe I am able to take a little bit more risk. And so maybe I wouldn't have done this before. Actually, no, I would have. <laughs> because money isn't my only motivator. And thrill is, isn't it? And maybe part of the danger of this is also the thrill <sighs> to admit that. So where to from here? I mean, this is just part one. I have the feeling that I'm going to move forward. I have the feeling that I'm going to protect myself as much as I can so that I can potentially opt out. I have the feeling that I already have so much out there that it would be possible for other people to do this of me already. So I may as well make it the official product. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da.
to think of ourselves as products. But no, it's not myself. It's not what I choose to see as myself. I choose to see it as a representation of what I'm capable of. And I think that you can also do that when it comes to sex work in itself. I think that you don't have to go in thinking this is entirely me doing this thing and entirely experiencing and entirely getting out. I mean, who does that with their jobs, you know, any job? I think that would cause a burnout. <laughs> like it has for me in the past. So maybe that's my learning there. Compartmentalize, understand that things are an extension of your ability. And my AI companion might be that. <laughs> or who knows? Is it the real me talking to you right now? <laughs> or is it something I've created? <laughs> Thank you for letting me flesh out this thought experience meets real life happening around me. It's actually very interesting to be able to have this format, like a diary, a journal of sorts. I've never kept one. So welcome to my journal entries. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And I look forward to talking to you next time.